Thank you all so very much for joining us here for the El Paso History Radio Show, airing in this pre-recorded episode on News Radio 690 KTSM. I am your host, Andrew J. Polk. Thank you for tuning in, however you may be doing so. Be it on air, online, live streaming through the free and reliable iHeartRadio app, or joining us over on our various social media channels. Of course, we have the El Paso History Radio Show on Facebook, El Paso History TV over on YouTube, and also similarly named also under Andrew J. Polk. Myself, of course, under similar Facebook, YouTube, and even Twitter and Twitch.tv pages and channels there. So, of course, today is Saturday, January 28th, and we are talking about what is actually on the ground, the history that has been... Well, part of the background of going on in the Doranguito area discussion, but what are some of the realities? What is actually physically there? What is the history? What is the significance? And, well, what might be coming in the future, but primarily what's on the ground and what are those buildings? So... We'll be talking about that today here. Uh, of course, you can find us over on some of the partner pages we have as well, promos, including in, in El Paso, Inc. this week, but also on our partner Facebook groups, Remember in El Paso, when where we definitely appreciate that. And we say all of this because this is, of course, the place where we say Texas history begins in El Paso. And we do have a history moment at the top of Hour 2 from documentary filmmaker Jackson Polk talking this week about El Pasoan Dale Wrestler. Might recognize that name from a couple of ways, and Hill will delve into that. But joining us here in studio today, we are joined by El Paso historian David Romo, who has done a significant amount of work into, well, the ground, the area, the buildings, the people that inhabited them, and the significance that brings to it in the area that has come to be known, um, the more modern sense, as Duranguito. So thank you very much for joining us here today. Thank you. Absolutely happy to have you on because, I mean, as much as there has been, okay, just want to make this clear. There have certainly been controversy, court cases, votes, a lot of stuff that happened on that area, and we're not necessarily here to to touch on that, but some of the questions that have kind of come around it, I mean, this does come as we are recording this episode and as it will be airing in the same month as there was a city council vote to make changes and, and kind of move on from this project. We're not here to necessarily comment on those parts of it, but the more interesting question for me, for our purpose here is, okay, now that there may be some answers kind of settled about what will be happening next, at the very least in the kind of 30,000 foot view of what might be built, demolished, etc. Now that those, some of those questions have been resolved, what's actually there? What is the history? What are the buildings? Because there are certain, I mean, I'll be perfectly honest. I'm not totally familiar with everything on the ground there. There are certain buildings and phrases I'm familiar with, like, you know, Chinese laundry, uh, some of the tenement buildings, uh, the mansion, uh, Flor de Luna, which is probably the most arguably the most recognizable one, the very least when it comes right. to like pictures and way things have been put up about the area, but what's actually like the significance behind them and why there was a lot of conversation about historic preservation, even into some of the uh, latest discussions involving uh, official action. That's the part that we're really here to talk about today, though, of course, uh, David, you yourself have done extensive research on this, including uh, into the very name of it, which That's of right. course has been not necessarily a source of solely of controversy, but has certainly been discussed. So for those unfamiliar with, with what we're talking about, how do you kind of even bound the area we're talking about, Duranguito? Okay. So um, beginning in the 1990s, the, the, the first ward, the section that we now refer to as Duranguito, and it actually it was in the first part of the 20th century that it was referred to as Duranguito. Mm -hmm. So there's a lot of people that say, well, I can't remember it ever be being right. called Duranguito, and I was born in 1970. Well, um, a lot of the primary sources that refer to this neighborhood as Duranguito, um, they go back to about 1904. Okay. And so the first time that I find in the sources somebody calling it Duranguito was uh, David Concha. So he was one of these musicians that helped found the the McKinty Band and later the Symphony Orchestra. Mm -hmm. uh, he was a brother, I, I believe, of Trinidad Concha. And I write about that in my book, Ringside City of Revolution. And he told Oscar Martinez back in 1975 during an oral history interview, that is online now. So you can go yeah, to okay. the UTEP Special Collections and you'll find, look for David Concha. And he says... I'm going to quote what he says. There was a barrio called Duranguito. Duranguito started from San Francisco Street to Overland in light east of Santa Fe Street. It was mostly Mexicans who lived there. So David Concha immigrated to El Paso in, in the 1890s. Mm -hmm. So he was, and he mentions that in, in other parts of his interview, that around 1904, 
el segundo barrio había puras hierbas y so there was mostly just weed in the segundo barrio. Mm -hmm. And we see some photographs that, that I brought to you today right. that show um, how it was mostly the area today that we see as San Francisco Street. So this photograph here is from like the 1880s. And so you see San Francisco Street and Overland Street. Um, that's what gets uh, developed first. And, and then later it moves down. This was the first ward. So Duranguito has gone under a lot of names. Right. So beginning in 1873, that was the official part of the first ward. So a ward is like an electoral district. District. So the second mm -hmm. ward is later called the, the Segundo Barrio. So he refers to it first in 1904. In 1908, uh, there's another oral history also by Oscar Martinez, and this is Charles Porras, who was one of the founders of LULAC in El Paso in the 1930s. Ah, okay. mm -hmm. And he talks about he was born in 1901, and he said, My father had um, a, a s grocery store on Durango Street, and that whole neighborhood was called Duranguito or Barrio Durango. Mm. And so he refers to that. And then so the latest um, that I find it, that I find in the records, in primary records, you know, official records yeah, at sure. that time, was in a newspaper article. Uh, and it was an interview with Mario Modesto. And he was also another leader. There's a park named after him. Mm. And he talks about the three different neighborhoods that are, uh, in South El Paso, and he mentions the Segundo Barrio, Chihuahuita, and Duranguito. So he uses that word, right? So that's why a lot of people say, I've never heard of that word. I've only heard of it referred to as Union Plaza. Right. Well, Union Plaza didn't um, uh, originate that name until around 1990, 1989. And that was because a group of, of developers and, and city boosters wanted to create a four block area right next to Union uh, to the right Union yeah people. and it was only four blocks and that's what Union Plaza was and it wasn't until 1997 that people said let's let's create a whole district and let's call that Union Plaza so so then it became what you see the, the parameters of of Duranguito Union Plaza today which is east of um, east of more or less yeah Duran no e that east of the Union uh, uh, Depot, right, and mm. west of Santa Fe Street, north of Paisano. Okay, right? I mean, yeah, that was always the consideration for me. I, frankly, for until kind of these discussions came up about that area development of it, et cetera, I just thought of that as like, okay, just like south of the convention center, further downtown, because it wasn't until you get like across Paisano, you get into what I would consider Segundo Barrio, and then the Chihuahuita areas. But yeah, Union right. Plaza for me was always essentially. Okay, this is my age showing, but the clubbing area kind exactly. of next no, next to, to next to the actual Union Depot building. Yeah. So that's the way I always thought of it yeah. here. So as much as there has been the kerfuffles over the names here, the history further behind it. I mean, of course, the primary sources you're looking at, but the actual establishment of the area is kind of another almost subject entirely. And that's something where we have some uh, interesting maps actually coming on here right. because it wasn't necessarily, I mean, the whole development of El Paso as opposed to being, you know, Franklin or, uh, you know, the post pop uh, opposite, um, you know, El Paso del Norte and all those kind of considerations that could come along with it. Yeah. You actually trace some even, maybe even further back routes oh, yeah, than yeah. necessarily certain settlements or the names that we've just discussed so far came by, right? Oh yeah, it's definitely. So I, I was one of the, um, well, I was the, the main historian, Borderlands historian, that testified. I had the honor to testify during the court trial mm -hmm. related to the Texas Antiquities Law that the city uh, recently dropped their case before right. the mm -hmm. Texas Supreme Court. Part of the reason we're, we're doing this whole thing here today, so yeah, exactly. I, I went to about four or five different archives in, in, uh, both in Mexico and the United States and search literally through thousands of Spanish um, uh, documents, colonial Spanish documents, mm -hmm. to, to locate what other historians kind of vaguely knew, that there was an Apache peace settlement, mm -hmm. a kind of proto-reservation before the American reservations of the Apaches. The Spaniards had these so-called reservation. I mean, yeah, before there was even, you know, U.S. control of this area. Right. And so we actually have uh, a map that I do believe you put together That's on right. this subject here. So yeah. uh, for those who can't see it, titled a Mex Mescalero Peace Settlement at El Paso, 1790 to 1806. And 
it's overlaid on kind of the modern map that people would be able to exactly. recognize here. Prominent features are, of course, kind of the, well, what, Sunset Heights area, among other right. things. But then also the uh, rail yards that kind of go at near what we currently have the bend of the Rio Grande is as. But right. it's also, as we've talked about multiple times in the show, the Rio Grande isn't exactly, uh, in the historical sense, a tamed river. Right. And it definitely it wasn't times. moved quite a lot in so the 1790s mm -hmm. the rio grande was where paisano uh, uh, drive is today mm -hmm. and and so i was able to come across some fascinating documentation that that changes how we understand the history of the area beginning in 1598 where a lot of people think that the oñate crossing is close to hearts mill mm -hmm. the old hacienda and what i found and i think i'm no, uh, there had been other scholars that had already uh, seen this, that there were actually two crossings, okay. not only one. And Oñate went through the lower crossing. So the upper crossing was about, um, uh, it was about, what, 3.5 miles from the mission. And then there was another crossing 1.3 miles from the mission, and that's on the corner of Santa Fe, more or less yeah. using GPS. On the corner of Santa Fe. And the mission and we're talking Cristiano. about here would be what is now essentially the main cathedral, the main in, cathedral in, in what Guadalupe, is now Ciudad Juarez. The Guadalupe Mission, which or originally was was La Misión de los Indios Mansos. Right. So that was a mission for the Manso Indians, right? And so I found that there was a bridge there at, at the corner more or less of, of Paisano and Santa Fe Street that the, the Spaniards had done to be able to monitor this Apache peace camp, this Mescalero peace camp. They, and they don't call themselves Apaches. They call themselves the Ende people. Ende mm. is the term for people. The in, people, right? In, more or less. In their language, yeah. So um, I found documentation that says this peace camp was right next to this wooden bridge. So that it led me to look at the mappings where this wooden bridge was. And they had their own acequia. An acequia is an irrigation ditch mm -hmm. for their cornfields and their bean fields. That's an acequia. And so that, the acequia that most of us knew for a long time, you know, who, who called uh, that area, Duranguito, the birthplace of El Paso? Well, Sonicsen, some of the early historians, even uh, Owen, there were early historians that already said, well, you know, there was, there, there was a settlement there that was the first Mexican settlement in 827, north of the river. Right. Because there had been other settlements. Oh, certainly, like yeah. The Bruzuela settlement that's closer to Chihuahuita, but that was south of the river. So the first Mexican settlement, it, and that's what, what we've always been taught, you know, the historian, local historians, was um, the Maria Ponce de Leon Ranch. Right. And so that was where later, you know, the post opposite, opposite El Paso, where Franklin, uh, the village of Franklin, uh, that it came under many names and later it was the first ward. But mm -hmm. what I found is that no, the first documented actual major settlement was an indigenous settlement about 800 to um, 1,000 Apaches. And what was really fascinating is that there was an acequia, an irrigation district right. before the Ponce de Leon acequia. Because the Ponce de Leon acequia went along like San Francisco Street. But there was another okay. acequia called the Bernal acequia, and that's the Javier Francisco Bernal acequia that intersects Duranguito. It cuts right down the middle. And so why would you have an acequia for a settlement if the first settlement was in 1827? Particularly since, I mean, acequias in this concept are, I mean, uh, people may be familiar with, uh, you know, some that are still exist and very visible in like, you know, the lower valley, you know, and the Mission Valley, like the Acequia Madre and things like that. But, yeah. you know, the, the term for those unfamiliar with that would be closer would be canal. And of course, right. that firmly denotes man-made, created for right. a purpose, as opposed to just, yeah, yeah, there's a waterway there, I guess we'll go around it here. And acequia no. is yeah. built for a purpose. And so that's why, yeah. among other things, this is significant in the way you're talking so about it. The really exciting discovery is that there was the Barnala Sequia, and and I had already seen the original deed before doing research before, and I said, and that was like, huh, like who who's Bernal and who did the this Sequia? Well, Francisco Bernal was the militia ca captain of the Presidio from El Paso del Norte that was in charge of the peace camp, and he also provided food for them and what have you. So I said, oh, that makes sense. 
That's why you have this irrigation ditch 20, 30 years before the so-called first settlement. So that totally it, it means we got to rethink of where we, not only what the first settlement was mm. in El Paso, so now we bring it back to the 1790s. I found a lot of documentation. Tell you what, let's get into that here. Got to take that first break of this hour already here, but we got a lot more history we'll be getting into, including, of course, the buildings that we can see there currently. Uh, we're going to jam pack a lot into this two hours as much as we mm-hmm. can. So, of course, uh, joining us here in pseudo right now, uh, El Paso historian David Romo, talking about some of his research and, again, what is on the ground here, and in fact, uh, under the ground currently in some of these instances. So stay tuned. More after this next break here on the El Paso History Radio Show on News Radio 690. KTSM. You are listening to the El Paso History Radio Show streaming on Facebook, where you can find archived radio programs. The El Paso History Radio Show also streams on the Facebook page Remember in El Paso When, run by Chief Administrator Barbara Given Bainey, known as BGB. Check out that page for thousands of archived pictures and videos of El Paso history. Remember in El Paso When on Facebook. Visit Mission Del Rey Southwest for a huge selection of El Paso souvenirs, decor, and gifts. Mission Del Rey features El Paso saddle blanket products and thousands of Southwest, Native American, and Mexico items, plus unique pottery, blankets, and turquoise jewelry. Bring your family and out-of-town guests to visit Mission Del Rey Southwest's large showroom at Lee Trevino and Pelicano and see their website at missiondelrey.com, 915-440-2140 for souvenirs, gifts, and decor. Mission Del Rey Southwest. Pepe's New Mexican Restaurant and Cantina serves the old Griggs Mexican food recipes in a new location at 6761 Donovan Drive. Enjoy great New Mexican food with cold beer and the Juan and only margarita from the cantina. The managers and cooks from the original Griggs Restaurant serve tacos, combination plates, and sopapillas. Get the best Mexican food in the valley at Pepe's New Mexican Restaurant and Cantina, 6761 Donovan near Loop 375. Call 877-2152. M1 EP Management Corporation is proud to sponsor the El Paso History Show. If you're tired of the ups and downs of the stock market, invest in real estate. M1 EP manages apartments in El Paso and helps investors buy, hold, and sell property. See the website, m1ep.com, m numeral one epcom To learn more about the many benefits and long-term appreciation, call 915-592-4549. 915-592-4549. Many retired El Paso area homeowners don't know where to begin when it comes to downsizing and selling their home. Patrick Tuttle and his legacy home team follow a proven process to help retired homeowners sell faster and for more money. Call Patrick Tuttle at 915-588-1850 today and get your home sold faster and for more money. That's Patrick Tuttle at 915-588-1850. Call him today. The El Paso History Radio Show also streams on Saturday mornings on our YouTube channel, El Paso History TV. Go to youtube.com slash El Paso History TV for archives of the El Paso History Radio Show. Also on that YouTube channel, you can see for free many other videos, documentaries, and lectures about El Paso area history at youtube.com slash El Paso History TV. Additionally, watch a dozen TV documentaries about El Paso history for free there on our YouTube channel. This includes Legends of El Paso's Mountains, Gunfights of the Old West, El Paso's Waco Tanks, Mexican Revolution Sites in El Paso, and eight more TV documentaries produced by El Paso filmmaker Jackson Polk since 2001. And at youtube.com slash El Paso History TV, you can watch for free 20 short videos we produced that were broadcast on ABC7 KVIA TV newscasts. This series is called El Paso History TV and features Spanish missions and churches on El Paso's Mission Trail, plus the Guadalupe Mission in Juarez, Mexico. That church was built in 1659 and is the oldest known adobe building on the El Paso Juarez Valley. It still welcomes Catholic worshipers today. Go to El Paso History TV on YouTube.com. You are listening to the El Paso History Radio Show streaming on Facebook, where you can find archived radio programs. The El Paso History Radio Show also streams on the Facebook page Remember in El Paso When, run by Chief Administrator Barbara Given Bainey, known as BGB. Check out that page for thousands of archived pictures and videos of El Paso history. Remember in El Paso when on Facebook. Visit Mission Del Rey Southwest for a huge selection of El Paso souvenirs, 
decor, and gifts. Mission Del Rey features El Paso saddle blanket products and thousands of Southwest, Native American, and Mexico items, plus unique pottery, blankets, and... Thank you all so very much for joining us here for the El Paso History Radio Show, airing in this pre-recorded episode on News Radio 690 KTSM. Of course, we are the El Paso History Radio Show on Facebook. You can head to that page to find our weekly promo announcement, some of the pictures coming up, expectations of our discussions for each week. Also, our YouTube channel, youtube.com slash El Paso History TV, where you can find both the stream of this, the previous episodes, because the beautiful thing and why we're on the social media channels this way is it serves also as our online archive, as you can go and see the full previous episodes there. In addition to that, of course, up on the YouTube page is the full series of El Paso Gold DVDs, the entire series from Capstone Productions, covering more than the last couple of decades of documentary production here in town, uploaded for free for your viewing pleasure, plus the more recent 20 ABC7 History TV segments from El Paso History TV. So, a lot of content out there. If you want to delve into it, you can certainly do the deep dive or just catch up on our shows if you missed us live each week. Also a reminder to support some of our sponsors on the program. Pepe's Restaurant in Kenya Tio is open for in-house dining. Find them at 6761 Donovan Drive. Either head up Donovan and you'll find them on the left as you're headed north or go down Talbot Drive. There'll be a left once you hit that T intersection. In any case, if you need directions or uh, find out their hours that week, 915-877-2152. 915-877-2152. It is, of course, a home of the Juan and only Margarita and continuing on of the old great Greg's recipes, old recipes, new food, and uh, delicious. I'll be headed out there this Saturday uh, right after our broadcast concludes today. But again, joining us here in studio right now, we are joined by El Paso historian David Romo talking about history of a different area of town than Pepe's over there. Uh, what's uh, the Duranguito area, of course, the bounds that we're talking about, and the history under it. And so I want to refer back to that map that we had popped up here, the one that's from a modern standpoint, would be uh, you have it overlaid on the <clears throat> modern map of well, it is now downtown El Paso, the uh, the, the rail uh, shift yard that is well, essentially connects right to the actual Union Depot building is recognizable there in the current right. path of it. But a couple other things besides, like I say, we can see the Asequia Madre, some of the trails where the Rio Grande was at that point in time. But the particular point I want to make here is about the Camino Real that you right. have it noted as coming through. What it would be kind of near-ish, the what would be now the Santa Fe Bridge, but then coming up, of course, much more where the Rio Grande was at that point in time, essentially along Paisano, like you were right. saying. Mm -hmm. And that, of course, connects a lot deeper into, of course, the full Camino Real and uh, further down into you know Mexico and going further up into uh, more or less terminating Santa Fe, though there's a lot of uh, trail heads that also diverge from there. So a very much influential crossing point of what would become a you, I mean, the highway of the time, basically. Right. So the Camino Real, of course, is a north-south trajectory of migration that really had been an, uh, a native trail before. During the Spanish colonial period, it connected Mexico City to Santa Fe, mm -hmm. or it created that, right? So in 1598, you had uh, Juan de Oñate bring 400 uh, uh, Spanish-European settlers, and, and that was the first major movement to create a permanent settlement. There had been other incursions into what is now, you know, the region of New Mexico and no, sure. what the contemporary United States before, but most of them had been uh, expeditions for e either slave hunting or missionaries uh, or soldiers, you know, that. so th those weren't the permanent settlements in right. this part of the world. Um, and that happened 20 years before Plymouth Rock. And I'm not going to get into whether we had the first Thanksgiving or not because there's a lot of debate. That's a different but, debate. So we <laughs> definitely preceded Plymouth Rock mm -hmm. by at least 20 years, right? Plymouth Rock is in, in, in 1620. And that's what all kids are taught in school, that that's how the United States, you know, began. That's the origin story, right? But we have a different origin story. And and, and, and so when I presented my research, and I'm going to publish it, by the way. In, Excellent. In a, okay. It's a chapter. Uh, 50 pages and thoroughly documented, so it's it's out there for scholars to agree with or disagree with. I presented it as part of this trial, and we won. The city's experts could not contest mm. the documentation that I presented. And so this is going to shift, and, and, and I'm very open to scholarly debate because I we brought in, I collaborated with um, uh, David Muñiz, who's an archaeologist from Ciudad Juarez, who helped me with the GIS mapping of trying to figure out 
where that crossing took place. Mm -hmm. So that means that El Paso del Norte, we aren't the other Plymouth Rock. The Plymouth Rock is the other Paso del, del, Norte. del Norte. Right? We This not only changes how we look at our city, because for a long time we thought that the first settlement was, say, 27, etc. Now this changes how we look at the country, of the country's history as well. The national uh, collective memory of what is the origin story. Right? So here we have a place that uh, Camino Real, the first Camino Real goes through Duranguito when it crosses mm -hmm. what is Paisano Street, the Rio Grande. Where do you go through? Well, through the first bar, through Duranguito. So here we have a national story, and that makes it even more uh, important to save. And and really what, what the community has done, and it really has been fighting the, the destruction of Duranguito, Duranguito, not since 2016 when the city voted to use eminent domain no, sure. and destroy all those buildings there. It was really the first time that it's mentioned in a plan. It was the city plan of 2006. So people have been fighting almost two decades to save this. And after two decades, thanks to a lot of collaboration, all right? There's a lot oh, of certainly. behind the scenes, mm -hmm. and usually there's just a few names that get to be you know mentioned in the media. But we know that it took a lot of people to fight this. And we're, we're going to have a big pachanga celebration of mm -hmm. uh, a block party on February 4th okay. in Duranguito. It's from 1 to 5, and, and we'll have bands, music, art, everything. And we want to thank everybody that helped defend the, the birthplace of El Paso. It's people. It's and we'll history. And we'll be talking more about that throughout here. But i got to take that next break right now. So coming out of this, let's talk more about that history, more about particularly the buildings now. We've gotten to okay. some of the kind of like, you know, literal foundations. And yeah. we'll talk more about actual physical foundations as well. But also the many buildings there. Again, some of the names that we've mentioned that people may or may not recognize. And more than I'm sure I even know. So we'll delve more into that. So stay tuned. More on the El Paso History Radio Show after this next break on News Radio 690. KTSM. You are listening to the El Paso History Radio Show streaming on Facebook, where you can find archived radio programs. The El Paso History Radio Show also streams on the Facebook page Remember in El Paso When, run by Chief Administrator Barbara Given Bainey, known as BGB. Check out that page for thousands of archived pictures and videos of El Paso history. Remember in El Paso When on Facebook. Visit Mission Del Rey Southwest for a huge selection of El Paso souvenirs, decor, and gifts. Mission Del Rey features El Paso saddle blanket products and thousands of Southwest, Native American, and Mexico items, plus unique pottery, blankets, and turquoise jewelry. Bring your family and out-of-town guests to visit Mission Del Rey Southwest's large showroom at Lee Trevino and Pelicano and see their website at missiondelrey.com, 915-440-2140 for souvenirs, gifts, and decor. Mission Del Rey Southwest. Pepe's New Mexican Restaurant and Cantina serves the old Griggs Mexican food recipes in a new location at 6761 Donovan Drive. Enjoy great New Mexican food with cold beer and the Juan and only margarita from the cantina. The managers and cooks from the original Griggs Restaurant serve tacos, combination plates, and sopapillas. Get the best Mexican food in the valley at Pepe's New Mexican Restaurant and Cantina, 6761 Donovan near Loop 375. Call 877-2152. M1 EP Management Corporation is proud to sponsor the El Paso History Show. If you're tired of the ups and downs of the stock market, invest in real estate. M1 EP manages apartments in El Paso and helps investors buy, hold, and sell property. See the website, m1ep.com, m numeral one epcom To learn more about the many benefits and long-term appreciation, call 915-592-4549. 915-592-4549. Many retired El Paso area homeowners don't know where to begin when it comes to downsizing and selling their home. Patrick Tuttle and his legacy home team follow a proven process to help retired homeowners sell faster and for more money. Call Patrick Tuttle at 915-588-1850 today and get your home sold faster and for more money. That's Patrick Tuttle at 915-588-1850. Call him today. The El Paso History Radio Show also streams on Saturday mornings on our YouTube channel, El Paso History TV. Go to youtube.com slash El Paso History TV for archives of the El Paso History Radio Show. Also on that YouTube channel, you can see for free many other videos, documentaries, and lectures about El Paso area history. 
at youtube.com. Thank you all so very much for joining us here for Talk for the El Paso History Radio Show on News Radio 690 KTSM. I'm your host, Andrew J. Polk. Of course, i uh, got some other of our great partners in promoting aspects of local El Paso and even regional history to talk about. Of course, the great group over at Celebration of Our Mountains, often having a lot of different hikes and things going on, including, all right, you missed that out if you're only hearing about it now, but they're doing today the Fillmore Canyon and mounting history, mining history of the uh, Oregon Mountains. But they got other stuff coming up later in uh, the next month as well, including Birdwalk and Mesilla Valley, Bosque State Park, uh, La Revolución Mexicana, uh, some other focuses on those events and history there, Hike to the Tin Mine. So they got a whole series of events going on throughout this season and even later into the year. So find them, of course, Celebration of Our Mountains is where you can find them at celebrationofourmountains.org or just search them online on your favorite search engine. It's a longish name, Celebration of Our Mountains. And, of course, there's a lot of other events that are going on in and around the region. So uh, be sure to – they often have a uh, decent uh, overview of all of them. But, again, joining us here in studio right now, we are, of course, joined by uh, El Paso historian uh, David Romo talking about the history – both what can be seen under the ground, and of course, there's archaeological evidence, but also want to make sure to focus on what is still physically present, able to be seen, I guess, more accurately, about what is in the area we are discussing that That's had right. been source and probably will still can be source of controversy in its own way, but the Duranguito area. And so we have this picture that we had up uh, briefly in previous segments. So kind of yeah. set this one up again, because essentially uh, the way it's listed here is a, a, a looking uh, view of El Paso from the West. So we are looking right. um, from, uh, I guess, what might be what, some... What is Sunset Heights today? Yeah, what is Sunset Heights today? And so, There's a hill there, and, and, and this picture mm-hmm. was taken south. So you can see the uh, Chihuahua Street, the, the bigger avenue. It's a dirt. It's not a street. It, it was a dirt road at that right. time. And then you, if, you close, if you do a close-up, you'll see the, the corner of Overland Street mm-hmm. and Chihuahua Street. So that's one of the oldest homes that still exists in Duranguito today. Uh, and that was owned by a woman by the name of Benancia Scarate Stephenson, who went by a lot of different names in her life. Mm-hmm. So she was uh, one of the elite women of, of both sides of the border, really. She had like the, the prominent families on both sides of the border. She got married three on three different occasions. The first time was to Lieutenant uh, Garza, and he was a... a uh, Hispano Civil War a participant for the Confederates. Hmm. And there weren't too many of those, right? Yeah. There were some Tejanos uh, that fought for sure. the Confederacy, but uh, most of them fought for the Union. And uh, after he passes away, uh, her land gets taken away because her father, Hugh Stephenson, uh, was a Confederate sympathizer. Ah, okay. And so th- here comes this guy, uh, um, Captain French, Albert French, and he helps the family because he's now a union officer to get back their lands. So, of course, Hugh Stephenson was one of the early Anglo um, uh, settlers of the area, and most Anglo settlers would marry the richest uh, Mexican or Fronteriza women. And, mm-hmm. and, and so, um, so that was kind of how people made their money, you know, at that time. I call them male gold diggers. I'm not the only one that calls them that. There's other historians <laughs> okay. that call them male gold diggers. You, you, you figure out who's the richest woman in town. You marry her, and then you get all her networks and even some of the land. So um, her father was able to obtain Concordia, Rancho Concordia, mm-hmm. because of this intermarriage. So when her father dies, it's Benancia and her other siblings that get most of the land. So Benancia, that's how she got her, her money. Mm. And then she later married uh, John Leahy, who got rich himself. So these guys, Albert French came here with very little money. Mm. He was just a Civil War uh, you know, captain. And he, he later became one of the richest men in El Paso, according to the census. So she, it was her money that was really you know, passed down through... Generational father. wealth. Right, yeah. generational wealth. And, of course, I mean, some of the names, her initial one there anyway, before, you know, the marriage names changes. I mean, Escarate may be of significance to some oh, people yeah, in the region absolutely. as well. Absolutely. There's the Escarate land grant. And that, okay, that's another story. There's a fraudulent land grant named the Escarate land grant. But the Concordia wasn't right. fraudulent. And, and and she she owned a, a lot of the land right there next to the Coliseum, all that Concordia and the 
three buildings, the three oldest buildings of Duranguito, mm-hmm. and one of them, the one that we just saw right now, that was from 1885, 1886. And mm-hmm. so remember, I mean, uh, uh, Geronimo was still fighting the U.S. Army at that time. Oh, yeah. So that's, uh, and it was built in this, it, um, it has these beautiful, not that one, but what we see as the Flor de Luna. I don't know if we have a picture oh, of the yes, Flor we de do. Luna. Mm-hmm. Yeah, look at that beautiful kind of bay window. You know, it's a Victorian Overhang, style. Overhang, yeah. Yeah, so like if you go to San Francisco, shh, you know, a building like that is is worth millions, right? Because you, you, you And they're all over the up, place, yeah. And they're all over the place. So what I'm saying, like, oh, my God. Doesn't the city like realize its treasure? Look at the inside, how it, it used to look. And this is just like one month before that whole controversial thing that, that the developers that owned it did a drive by. The they, whole punch. They, they, they punched the hole mm-hmm. on it. And now, thankfully, it's been repaired because I think the, the idea was that if you punch the hole, it's going to fall. But no, these old buildings were made to last. You know. I mean, this one dating from, I mean, some of the dates you have there. I mean, this is the interior view, but, you know, yeah. 1887, 1888. For something to right. last that long overall, I mean, it's not like we are the most uh, geologically active area. But, I mean, there's been, you know, the spare earthquake or two or ground shaking yeah. in our area. So anything that wasn't built to last, well, just simply put, tends not to. Yeah. And that building has so much history. I mean, one heart has his offices there. So Hart, he was, uh, oh God, well, he was the publisher of the El Paso Times, and later he was a captain in, in, during the Spanish-American War. There were poets from the Mexican Revolution that were in exile who, who lived there. There was a, one particular, Manuel Rocha, who lived there. Um, there's just so much history. That place is kind of tells the, the, the multicultural history of Duranguito because it's, I call it Duranguito is the the place where the border meets the world, because they there were immigrants from all over the place from Europe. A lot of there was people don't know that especially Leon Street and part of Chihuahua Street there was at least 155 African Americans mm-hmm. during the 19 the the census of 1910 list 155 African Americans that I counted, um, and and there were people from like. Italy, there's there's one uh, Luigi Papa, and people might know that have kept up with the Duranguito struggle. Romelia Mendoza, she's one of the women that owns her house, uh, and fought to the very end. And there was this, yeah, there, there 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 was this Italian Luigi Papa, who was the big chef at the El Paso del Norte Hotel, mm-hmm. and he intermarries uh, Fronteriza women. So this is the place where. Especially men from all over the world, Italians. Man, I even saw some, you know, there were Germans. There was some, I mean, Norwegian, sure, and all kinds of people, and they, an African American, and they intermarry with the Fronteriza women, and so they learn Spanish. So Luigi changes his name to Luis. Mm, uh, okay. So that it's kind of like uh, what you would say reverse assimilation, uh, uh, and so that th- there's so many hidden stories about what these buildings mean. There's another building there that was where the first um, Yom Kippur was held mm. that 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 met the color, yeah, that purple one that we're seeing in front of us. Um, and that was the president of the B'nai Zion congregation that at, at that time was an Orthodox Jewish congregation in, in 1901, had the first a fully quorumed Yom Kippur celebration one of the highest uh, moments in, in in the religious tradition you know the calendars of of, of jewish uh practice well tell you uh, what let's put a pin on that for just a second here got to take that next break right now of course. we're going to be trying to talk more about the buildings here we'll see how much we can cram into the remainder of the program basically because there's a lot of different buildings and history attached with them so talk more about that after this next break again david romo el paso historian joining us here in studio talking more with him about this and the subjects there so stay tuned for more after this break on the el paso history radio show on news radio 690 ktsm you are listening to the el paso history radio show streaming on facebook where you can find archive radio programs the el paso history radio show also streams on the facebook page remember in el paso when run by chief administrator barbara given baney known as bgb Check out that page for thousands of archived pictures and videos of El Paso history. Remember in El Paso when on Facebook. 
Visit Mission Del Rey Southwest for a huge selection of El Paso souvenirs, decor, and gifts. Mission Del Rey features El Paso saddle blanket products and thousands of Southwest, Native American, and Mexico items, plus unique pottery, blankets, and turquoise jewelry. Bring your family and out-of-town guests to visit Mission Del Rey Southwest's large showroom at Lee Trevino and Pelicano and see their website at missiondelrey.com, 915-440-2140 for souvenirs, gifts, and decor. Mission Del Rey Southwest. Pepe's New Mexican Restaurant and Cantina serves the old Griggs Mexican food recipes in a new location at 6761 Donovan Drive. Enjoy great New Mexican food with cold beer and the Juan and only margarita from the cantina. The managers and cooks from the original Griggs Restaurant serve tacos, combination plates, and sopapillas. Get the best Mexican food in the valley at Pepe's New Mexican Restaurant and Cantina, 6761 Donovan near Loop 375. Call 877-2152. M1 EP Management Corporation is proud to sponsor the El Paso History Show. If you're tired of the ups and downs of the stock market, invest in real estate. M1 EP manages apartments in El Paso and helps investors buy, hold, and sell property. See the website, m1ep.com, m1ep.com. To learn more about the many benefits and long-term appreciation, call 915-592-4549. 915-592-4549. Many retired El Paso area homeowners don't know where to begin when it comes to downsizing and selling their home. Patrick Tuttle and his legacy home team follow a proven process to help retired homeowners sell faster and for more money. Call Patrick Tuttle at 915-588-1850 today and get your home sold faster and for more money. That's Patrick Tuttle at 915-588-1850. Call him today. The El Paso History Radio Show also streams on Saturday mornings on our YouTube channel, El Paso History TV. Go to youtube.com slash El Paso History TV for archives of the El Paso History Radio Show. Also on that YouTube channel, you can see for free many other videos, documentaries, and lectures about El Paso area history at youtube.com slash El Paso History TV. Additionally, watch a dozen TV documentaries about El Paso history for free there on our YouTube channel. This includes Legends of El Paso's Mountains, Gunfights of the Old West, El Paso's Waco Tanks, Mexican Revolution Sites in El Paso, and eight more TV documentaries produced by El Paso filmmaker Jackson Polk since 2001. And at youtube.com slash El Paso History TV, you can watch for free 20 short videos we produced that were broadcast on ABC7 KVIA TV newscasts. This series is called El Paso History TV and features Spanish missions and churches on El Paso's Mission Trail, plus the Guadalupe Mission in Juarez, Mexico. That church was built in 1659 and is the oldest known adobe building on the El Paso Juarez Valley. It still welcomes Catholic worshipers today. Go to El Paso History TV on YouTube.com. You are listening to the El Paso History Radio Show streaming on Facebook, where you can find archive radio programs. The El Paso History Radio Show also streams on the Facebook page Remember in El Paso When, run by Chief Administrator Barbara Gibbon-Baney, known as BGB. Check out that page for thousands of archived pictures and videos of El Paso history. Remember in El Paso when on Facebook. Visit Mission Del Rey Southwest for a huge selection of El Paso souvenirs, decor, and gifts. Mission Del Rey features El Paso saddle blanket products and thousands of Southwest, Native American, and Mexico items, plus unique pottery, blankets, and turquoise jewelry. Bring your family and out-of-town guests to visit Mission Del Rey Southwest's large showroom at Lee Trevino and Pelicano and see their website at missiondelrey.com. 915-440-2140 for souvenirs, gifts, and decor. Mission Del Rey Southwest. Pepe's New Mexican Restaurant and Cantina serves the old Griggs Mexican food recipes in a new location at 6761 Donovan Drive. Thank you all so very much for joining us here for the El Paso History Radio Show, airing in this pre-recorded episode on News Radio 690 KTSM. I am your host, Andrew J. Polk. Of course, uh, some of our other great partners and future guests on the program uh, include Rick Kern's music podcast, Talk and Rock Radio. We visited him with him previously in previous years in this program, but we'll have him in uh, these coming weeks. So TalkinRockRadio.com is where you can go to see, well, what he puts on and a lot of his music remembrances, some of like the golden age of rock and roll in El Paso, among other things, and some of the productions even still ongoing. He's got a lot of connections. And, of course, people may recognize him from having put on the Border Legends Tour, which I got to have a hand in on the back end, some of the production stuff here. But still those remembrances continuing on. Again, TalkinRockRadio.com. Dot com where you can find him. And of course, some of 
our other great sponsors on the program helping to support us and personally as well. Call 915-588-1850 for Patrick Tuttle Coldwell Banker Heritage Real Estate. 915-588-1850. Patrick and his team, excellent realtors here in El Paso for El Paso Homes for Sale or rent, including the houses that my family inhabit currently, both of them actually, and some of the previous ones that are no longer in our possession because we sold them with him. So if you want to have the same kind of great experience that we did, give him a call, 915-588-1850. But again, joining us here in studio right now, we are joined by El Paso historian David Romo as we are talking more about, again, some of the well, you can we talk about literal foundations and historical foundations of the area being discussed as Duranguito, and then of course some of the people actually involved in it and what can be seen there now. I mean, just, I want to spend one more moment here talking about the the interesting figure of uh, Bianca Escarate and Menacia Escarate, uh, particularly that the you're actually looking for her final resting place. It can be found, but it's under that uh, different name that you pointed out. Yeah, so she had so many names. She was born Benancia Escarate Stephenson, and then she got married the first time, Benancia Garza, then Benancia French, mm-hmm. and then Benancia Lihi. And in her gravestone, which they had a whole family plot at Concordia, uh, you see her as Nancy French. So I call her the woman with many, many names. Yeah, know? I mean, even yeah. some of her, her parentage there, I mean, that was... Right, uh, he was Stevenson. Who, so he came from Missouri in 1824 as a trapper. And like I said, he, he wasn't wealthy at all. He, he may have owned, you know, had, had very little capital to his Looking name. to make his fortune, so to yeah, speak. Yeah, he came here. And that was a traditional way to go, the MacGuffins, the Hards. They were all men that Anglo settlers that marry uh, into wealth, and they became Catholic. He, he was, Stephenson changes his name to Hugo Stephenson, and becomes Stefa, uh, Stephenson, and and becomes Catholic. You know, and that, that that was because the law required it. Mm. And then later, you know, a lot of them were Confederates. They they turn against the Mexicans. They join, like the MacGuffins. You know, they 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 join. They they become sometimes spies for. The, the angle you uh, occupying forces during 1848 so there's mm. there's a rich history there good or bad it's all history that we need oh, to yeah, acknowledge certainly. here in el paso right so some people would say well you know th- these are the greeter generations people like uh juan Azcarate and later Benancia, but that's part of our history so this Absolutely. is another mm-hmm. building that that she owns and then so she owns 300 uh, uh Chihuahua, south chihuahua street 303 so and 305 and i believe this is 305 i may be mistaken it might be 309 um and so that was today we want pla- the plan for the rebirth of, of Durango. Right. Mm. Uh, we have ideas of what to do with a, a lot of these buildings that incorporate the vision both of of the residents so that you don't kick out the residents but also honor its history so certainly uh that building we're thinking it should be like a museum of the mexican revolution yeah, so this is more of a, a it, rendering than what it a is rendering, i mean it's right. based on the building that is still yeah. currently there but on the side of it there's and, a uh, view of uh, i think that's a scene involving pancho villa yeah I mean, it's where there's some historians that believe that there's this great picture of, of pancho villa on an indian motorcycle so he bought a huh. lot of his uh automobiles and and uh, his motorcycles from Duranguito. So they, that picture, some historians believe, was actually taken in Duranguito. Others uh, think it wasn't. So we don't know for sure. I mean, dude got around, but he was also here. A but yeah, oh yeah, he was definitely in El Paso. So there's oral histories that he was in that building that we j- just showed you. Okay. Why? Because his attorney, uh, Rector Michael Dolan, was, let's see, let, let's look at that uh that other picture right next to Albert French. Uh, go closer to the Albert French. Okay. Uh, to the other way. Right. No, no. That That's how. Yeah. Okay. That's Rector Michael Dolan. And he was Pancho Villa's attorney, and he helped him uh, obtain favorable um, amnesty. Um, what, the favorable me- amnesty to, with the Mexican government. I was right? saying a lot, of ne- a lot of negotiations a lot that of happened negotiations. between, well, right. bo- both national governments, honestly. Right. So that's why... You know, it's sometimes it's difficult to confirm the oral histories that tie Pancho Villa to a specific building. But if if you have your lawyer living in that <laughs> building, then it's you know Od- it, it increases odds are, the odds yeah. that that he probably was in that building or likely was. Because you know the stash house, some people say that 
Pancho Villa was in the stash house, and that's r one block down from this house. Mm. But there's actually absolutely no record that he was there. It was Hipólito, his brother, that was at the stash house. But in this one, I think Pancho Villa, there's a good chance that he actually was in that building. There's other buildings that we know for sure he was at, and one of them is 510 Prospect. Mm. And that was, uh, that was you know, there's records that, that he was there for sure. And then there's a, um, the Roma Hotel that is now Burger King. So we know. Right, yeah, and the, the famous ice cream parlor show. Oh, yeah, the, he was in that one for sure. We, yeah. we have pictures of him inside. So, I mean, we think that should be a Mexican Revolution uh, museum site. Uh, and so, yeah, Benancia uh, uh, Scarlett Stevens that owned that building. There was another building right next to it that she owned, mm -hmm. the one that I told you. No, that one is actually the C.H. Lewis okay. uh, home. And it's it's the one that shows the oldest home, and we have a picture uh, of okay. it. Uh, yeah, so if you go right down, immediately down that picture, yeah. So that is how it looked later, right? And mm -hmm. Maybe uh, 20 years ago, that same home. And then there's one right next to it that is the C.H. Lewis. Mm -hmm. And and that's, uh, I think, it, I believe it's in Lakeside Architecture. I love the details. Uh, yeah, very that. interesting and differentiated. But tell you what, we'll talk more about that in the coming segment because we got to take the last break uh, for this hour and come back in the second hour of the program. There's a lot more. We've only begun to scratch the surface, including not even mentioning some of the buildings that uh, that I was talking about beforehand, like the firehouse, uh, the mansion, Douglas School. There's the whole lot more to get into here. So stay tuned for more as we get into uh, the second hour of the program here on the El Paso History Radio Show. Again, joining us here in studio is, of course, a David Romo, El Paso historian, talking more with him about the history, about the features that and buildings can still be seen there in the area. So stay tuned for more on the El Paso History Radio Show after this break in the top of the hour news on News Radio 690 KTSM. You are listening to the El Paso History Radio Show streaming on Facebook, where you can find archived radio programs. The El Paso History Radio Show also streams on the Facebook page Remember in El Paso When, run by Chief Administrator Barbara Gibbon Bainey, known as BGB. Check out that page for thousands of archived pictures and videos of El Paso history. Remember in El Paso when on Facebook. Visit Mission Del Rey Southwest for a huge selection of El Paso souvenirs, decor, and gifts. Mission Del Rey features El Paso saddle blanket products and thousands of Southwest, Native American, and Mexico items, plus unique pottery, blankets, and turquoise jewelry. Bring your family and out-of-town guests to visit Mission Del Rey Southwest's large showroom at Lee Trevino and Pelicano and see their website at missiondelrey.com. 915-440-2140 for souvenirs, gifts, and decor. Mission Del Rey Southwest. Pepe's New Mexican Restaurant and Cantina serves the old Griggs Mexican food recipes in a new location at 6761 Donovan Drive. Enjoy great New Mexican food with cold beer and the Juan and only margarita from the cantina. The managers and cooks from the original Griggs Restaurant serve tacos, combination plates, and sopapillas. Get the best Mexican food in the valley at Pepe's New Mexican Restaurant and Cantina, 6761 Donovan near Loop 375. Call 877-2152. M1 EP Management Corporation is proud to sponsor the El Paso History Show. If you're tired of the ups and downs of the stock market, invest in real estate. M1 EP manages apartments in El Paso and helps investors buy, hold, and sell property. See the website, m1ep.com, m numeral one ep.com. To learn more about the many benefits and long-term appreciation, call 915-592-4549. 915-592-4549. Many retired El Paso area homeowners don't know where to begin when it comes to downsizing and selling their home. Patrick Tuttle and his legacy home team follow a proven process to help retired homeowners sell faster and for more money. Call Patrick Tuttle at 915-588-1850 today and get your home sold faster and for more money. That's Patrick Tuttle at 915-588-1850. Call him today. The El Paso History Radio Show also streams on Saturday mornings on our YouTube channel, El Paso History TV. Go to youtube.com slash El Paso History TV for archives of the El Paso History Radio Show. Also on that YouTube channel, you can see for free many other videos, documentaries, and lectures about El Paso area history at youtube.com slash El Paso History TV. Additionally, watch a dozen TV documentaries about El Paso history for free there on our YouTube channel. This includes Legends of El Paso's Mountains, Gunfights of the Old West, El Paso's Waco Tanks, Mexican Revolution Sites in El Paso, 
and eight more TV documentaries produced by El Paso filmmaker Jackson Polk since 2001. And at youtube.com slash El Paso History TV, you can watch for free 20 short videos we produced that were broadcast on ABC7 KVIA TV newscasts. This series is called El Paso History TV and features Spanish missions and churches on El Paso's Mission Trail, plus the Guadalupe Mission in Juarez, Mexico. That church was built in 1659 and is the oldest known adobe building on the El Paso Juarez Valley. It still welcomes Catholic worshipers today. Go to El Paso History TV on YouTube.com. You are listening to the El Paso History Radio Show streaming on Facebook, where you can find archived radio programs. The El Paso History Radio Show also streams on the Facebook page Remember in El Paso When, run by Chief Administrator Barbara Gibbon Bainey, known as BGB. Check out that page for thousands of archived pictures and videos of El Paso history. Remember in El Paso When on Facebook. Visit Mission Del Rey Southwest for a huge selection of El Paso souvenirs, decor, and gifts. Mission Del Rey features El Paso saddle blanket products and thousands of Southwest, Native American, and Mexico items, plus unique pottery, blankets, and turquoise jewelry. Bring your family and out-of-town guests to visit Mission Del Rey Southwest's large showroom at Lee Trevino and Pelicano and see their website at missiondelrey.com, 915-440-2140 for souvenirs, gifts, and decor. Mission Del Rey Southwest. Pepe's New Mexican Restaurant and Cantina serves the old Griggs Mexican food recipes in a new location at 6761 Donovan Drive. Enjoy great New Mexican food with cold beer and the Juan and only margarita from the cantina. The managers and cooks from the original Griggs Restaurant serve tacos, combination plates, and sopapillas. Get the best Mexican food in the valley at Pepe's New Mexican. Thank you all so very much for joining us here for the El Paso History Radio Show, airing in this pre-recorded episode on News Radio 690 KTSM. I am your host, Andrew J. Polk. Thank you for joining us, however you may be doing so, be it on air, online, live streaming through the free and reliable iHeartRadio app, or joining us over on our various social media pages where you can also see the full video, the pictures we're talking about. And also see the past recordings and review this one if you want to catch it again. Again, Facebook, YouTube, Twitter, and Twitch. Find us either some combination of El Paso History, El Paso History TV, El Paso History Radio Show, or Andrew J. Polk on pretty much all of those. And, of course, starting out Hour 2 of the program, we're going to continue our discussion, of course, with El Paso historian David Romo about the Doraguito area, the history under, on top of, still present, on the ground there. But starting out Hour 2 of the program, as we usually do with a history moment from documentary filmmaker Jackson Polk talking this week about... Dale Wrestler, a name that you might recognize in a couple of different ways. Wrestler Drive on El Paso's west side, running from Interstate 10 to Trans Mountain Road, is a major traffic route for thousands of El Pasoans. But did you ever wonder who was Dale Wrestler? He was a prominent civic leader, entrepreneur, and philanthropist in El Paso. Born in 1899 on a farm in Indiana, Wrestler's family later moved to Colorado. In 1922, he married Nona Henry and continued farming until he went into the trucking business with his older brother. In 1930, he and his wife and their two children, Wayne and Bonnie, moved to El Paso where Dale transported miners to a copper mine in Silver City, New Mexico in a stretched Buick. In 1931, he was able to buy a bus line that took tourists to the newly discovered Carlsbad Caverns. He added Gray Line sightseeing tours in 1938 that connected with trains bringing people to El Paso and Juarez. Wrestler's business prospered over the years, and he took part in many businesses and civic endeavors in El Paso. He was elected to city council and served on the El Paso Planning Commission and the Highway Coordinating Commission. He was a major supporter of book designer and publisher J. Carl Herzog. In 1944, they formed the printing company Herzog and Wrestler, which allowed Herzog to continue his work on historical subjects related to the Southwest and Texas. For the rest of his life, Wrestler was active in the El Paso community. Camp Dale Wrestler near Cloudcroft, New Mexico was named for him to honor his many years of service to the Boy Scouts of America. March 19, 1970 was declared Dale Wrestler Day. Wrestler passed away in El Paso in May of 1976 at the age of 77. Thanks to Facebook page Remember in El Paso Win for the research on this history moment. I'm Jackson Polk for the El Paso History Radio Show. Of course, mentioned there and still definitely appreciated the great partner page in El Paso history work, Barbara Given Bainey, who's the operator of the great Facebook group, Remember in El Paso When. You can go there for archive pictures galore. More than 33,000 members as of last check. And it is, again, no mean feat in order to keep such a large and, well, it focused group 
on track task and on track. So remember, these administrators have worked hard in researching our history and the photos that, of course, demonstrate them. When others use their photos, they ask that credit be given to the site and a lot of credit, again, to be given to, again, Chief Admin Owner and Historian Barbara Giffen Bainey, affectionately known as BGB, plus, of course, Admins Rick Duncan, Rick Nahara, Margaret D. Smith, and Moderator Ben Vincent. They're always looking for a few more good hands in order to, well, do all the things that it takes to uh, make a group of, again, that size, scope, and importance function in this day and age. So if you're wanting to join their team, ask them to reach out again. Remember, in El Paso, when you can also see our promo announcements as they come each week for that. And I just have to say a note on that uh, that history moment. Definitely spent a lot of my summers growing up at Camp Del Wrestler and other similar places here. So uh, impacting bit of history there. But talking more about some other aspects of our history again, joined here in studio by El Paso historian David Romo as we are talking about parts of the history of the area known as Duranguito. Essentially, I kind of think of it as south of the convention center, north of Paisano, and then kind of bounded by, again, like the clubbing area and the kind of like restaurants over on the western half. And then, well, where do you kind of call it? I mean, you, you put out some kind of road definition, particularly the eastern part of it. Where do you call or kind of see the delineation of this area? So the first word would have been anything east of El Paso Street. But I think right now the area that we look at, yeah, e- e- uh, west of El Paso Street. Okay. And... Uh, Oh, I, I would say yeah, uh, east of the of the Union, that area that you're talking about, yeah, the, the I mean, original Union Plaza, which was a four block kind of nightclub area. And yeah, whatever. entertainment district, those kind of things that district. come along yeah. with it. Um, so part of the reason we're talking about this is, of course, that there has been uh, some action happening, at least governmentally, including uh, court cases and such. And one of the things that really incited this was from the, again, as we are recording earlier this month, January of 2023, a presentation given before a city council that was included a lot more about the potential things for Arena. And of course, some of that has been uh, dispensed with now. But the real interesting part was about this, this site analysis. So this is more or less the footprint area, as it has been referred to of what could have been arena construction and of real particular interest to me is the uh, left is the right half of this picture the left half shows uh, the actual map and sites of it there but on the right half it says seven structures uh, identified as independently eligible for historic designation by county survey and owned pardon me by the city and that is notable in a few different ways including some of the buildings we've already talked about including the um uh, first, Bene Zion, as we mentioned there, uh, Flor de Luna, and a few others, including the one that you want to turn into a potential museum for the Mexican Revolution. And there's a few others there also of note uh, that we're going to want to talk a little bit more about this hour and this segment, including the uh, the Trost uh, in the upper left-hand corner of the whole grid of it. People can see the Trost fire station, and then right below that, the people can see the mansion. So these are noticeable, recognizable landmarks already in that area yes. for anyone who is, I mean, even if you've driven by Paisano, you have probably noticed uh, the building I'm about to put up the uh, actual architectural rendering of now and that of the fire station that that's down there on the corner of Paisano. That's right. Yes. So that um, that rendering was probably done in 1929 because the building itself was constructed by the Trost firm in yep, Trost 19, and Trost. 1930. And that would be a wonderful place to have perhaps a museum to um, you know the 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 history of uh, of the fire department here in El Paso. There's so much fascinating stuff that you could do with that. Yeah, it's of note that uh, not okay, not right next door, but within that that area is actually a you know a, a, some commemorations of firefighters over the years and like right, it's the firefighters there. park. But it would be wonderful to have like these old uh, imagine have these old fire trucks right. and. And uh, how the firemen would go down in case of emergency and the bell and all that and have kids play with it. So right there, that's the corner of Santa Fe Street and Paisano. Right. So that would have been the original fort that the Manso Indians uh, taught the Oñate and the settlers, the European settlers, where to cross the, the river because the fort would have afforded... Um, the wagons not to get stuck, you know, deep right. in the river. It was Why the most, uh, afford in the case, we're not talking about the vehicles we're seeing. We're, the <laughs> right. the, we're talking about a basically a, a, a spot a river of the river where, where it would widen out and therefore become shallower. And therefore, right. you could get it. Anyone who's had a, had a Oregon Trail experience on the computer there might know that right. those can be interesting if treacherous potentially oh so yeah you the, you the having knowledge about it like you were saying there from right. indigenous groups would be very helpful. Exactly. And so that, I mean, we need to put not, not only 
that in, a, in, in part of the commemoration marker there, that this is the original Plymouth Rock, 20 years before Plymouth Rock, and also commemorate uh, the fire station. And then there's the, that other um, building right next to the Benancias, the three Benancia buildings, and that's the C.H. Lawrence, Charles mm. H. Lawrence. Mm -hmm. So Charles H. Lawrence was one of El Paso's most prominent grocers during the late 19th century, and he was known as the Sugar King. Why? Because during World War I, Lawrence was fi fined for illegally exporting sugar to Mexico. That was at a time where uh, yeah, there were rations. Stringent and controls on stringent food and control supplies. On food and supplies. So, so he was, you know, like I said, we got to honor both the, the, the good and the bad. So if he, was, if he was a sugar smuggler, well, at least he wasn't smuggling other stuff, I guess, right? I, I'm sure <laughs> if you want to equivocate on it. But, I mean, it's, 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 it's a kind of fascinating to think from the modern standpoint of smuggling sugar. sugar. I know. Not, not cocaine sugar, just regular like, like, yeah, not table missing. sugar. Not you've right. them at all, just literally yeah. the stuff that you would put into candy. And, yeah. I mean, it's prevalent as hell in the modern day, but at that point in time, I mean, it would have been still a pretty well imported and therefore valuable substance. And what I found fascinating that there were U.S. soldiers actually guarding and preventing the smuggling of sugar south with machine guns. So you could have gotten shot to death for importing sugar illegally and of course so many people died during the prohibition you know for oh, sure. for importing whiskey so that's part of our fascinating history right that uh, yep. whatever you know happens to be illegal then you, you can get shot for there's probably for crossing a, a market for it someone willing to take the risk right. to try to smuggle it i mean those those, right. stories, those stories continue so that's just history. like one little you know one little piece of information so in 1899 he obtained a permit from the city of El Paso to build a red brick Lakeview style home on 315 Chihuahua Street. And that's what we see. And we have what it looks like today. And you can see the same details on top. And that is one, unfortunately, one of the buildings that has a hole, but it has not fallen down because no. it, it was built to last. You know, it was in sheetrock, flimsy material. <laughs> this is like, yeah. you, you know, this is a hundred and what, from 1899, a 130-year-old uh, building. Yeah, coming right? up on it, yep. Yeah. So he married Bersabe Avila, who was a woman from Durango. Once again, the fronterizo thing. He was originally from um, from New York. He comes here uh, in the 1890s, and and he has seven children. So they're like you know early Mexican Americans, right? And so in in, yeah. in in 1898, he found a note threatening to burn his wholesale grocery store, which was like two blocks up the street on San Francisco, where more or less where the Civic Center is today. And that no okay. threatened him because he was hiring too many Mexicans, right? And so at that time, whether you were born in the U.S. or, or not, you were considered a Mexican if, if you were, had Mexican descent. Uh, and okay. so uh, his no read Lawrence, you're pretty uh, looking fellow who claimed to be a white man, having lots of Mexicans working for you when there's uh, lots of white men here in town half starving. Uh, for one work if you don't hire white men inside of 10 days we'll burn your store down and make your chances slim you having got as much shame about you as a dog so he got he gets this note right and he mm. says and it was spread to other uh, it was passed along to other grocers in in, in the durangito area so it, he was a target of it but not the sole target no, not the sole target okay but he was one of those people that that was hiring too many mexicans according to to whatever vigilante group was out there at that time, right? Mm. And he said, well, you know, I'm married to a Mexican woman. I, if they're good workers, I'm going to hire Mexicans. And if you don't like it, I have a shotgun in the back. And let me show you this uh, vest of this guy that tried to, to, you know, steal from my store. It has a boat. It has a little bit of blood right there and a big mm. bullet hole in the middle. <laughs> so he said, you're welcome to try to burn my house down. So that's a, a, a fascinating story of, that tells you a lot yeah. about what's going on in 1898 in El Paso, right? Yeah, that's a interesting anecdote that comes along with it here. Uh, looking at the dude, you might not think that. He looks pretty, uh, well, yeah. I'm not going to say mild-mannered, but as much yeah. as a photo can show here. I mean, he fits the character of the idea of a you know a turn of the century, turn of the 20th century grocer there. But uh, you've got a lot of interesting characters and figures throughout El Paso history. Much oh, yeah. like, you know, I'm not going to call him on the same level as Pancho Villa, but the let, sugar king. let's just say that given that there was a lot of, you know, cross-border transactions, so to speak, and colorful characters, I guess I'm not terribly surprised that someone willing to come here at that point in time and 
I mean, I kind of think of it sometimes as not exactly like a closing of the frontier era, but a lot more stuff was going on there. And of course, we're within, you know, the bounds of, you know, unrest already happening at that point in time right. within, you know, Mexico and the governments there. And because, I mean, it's, it's often tempting to think of like the Mexican Revolution on its own as this one defined era. And right. honestly, it's it's a hell of a lot more nebulous than that. Yeah, so. no, no. It's just fascinating. And, and you see, every one of these buildings has a whole bunch of these kinds of stories. Every one of these buildings is a chapter of our history, but I call it micro history. You're looking at little, little details, unexpected oh, sure. details that, that change the way you look at the past because you've been told one thing and then you really examine things under a microscope and you go, huh, it was a little more complicated. So smuggling wasn't only south from Mexico, north, but it was also from here south. And mm -hmm. people would get killed for smuggling sugar. You know, those kind of Sugar, things. of all things. The thing you can go and buy in the grocery store's exactly. shelves right now. So, okay, tell you what. we got to talk more about this and yeah. the interesting history of the buildings here. Got to take that next break right now. So coming out of this, more on some of the other buildings, including the ones that we've mentioned so far. So still talking with, of course, El Paso historian David Romo. But, so stay tuned for more on the El Paso History Radio Show after this break on News Radio 690 KTSM. You are listening to the El Paso History Radio Show streaming on Facebook where you can find archived radio programs. The El Paso History Radio Show also streams on the Facebook page Remember in El Paso When, run by Chief Administrator Barbara Given Bainey, known as BGB. Check out that page for thousands of archived pictures and videos of El Paso history. Remember in El Paso When on Facebook. Visit Mission Del Rey Southwest for a huge selection of El Paso souvenirs, decor, and gifts. Mission Del Rey features El Paso saddle blanket products and thousands of Southwest, Native American, and Mexico items, plus unique pottery, blankets, and turquoise jewelry. Bring your family and out-of-town guests to visit Mission Del Rey Southwest's large showroom at Lee Trevino and Pelicano and see their website at missiondelrey.com, 915-440-2140 for souvenirs, gifts, and decor. Mission Del Rey Southwest. Pepe's New Mexican Restaurant and Cantina serves the old Griggs Mexican food recipes in a new location at 6761 Donovan Drive. Enjoy great New Mexican food with cold beer and the Juan and only margarita from the cantina. The managers and cooks from the original Griggs Restaurant serve tacos, combination plates, and sopapillas. Get the best Mexican food in the valley at Pepe's New Mexican Restaurant and Cantina, 6761 Donovan near Loop 375. Call 877-2152. M1 EP Management Corporation is proud to sponsor the El Paso History Show. If you're tired of the ups and downs of the stock market, invest in real estate. M1 EP manages apartments in El Paso and helps investors buy, hold, and sell property. See the website, m1ep.com, m numeral one epcom To learn more about the many benefits and long-term appreciation, call 915-592-4549. 915-592-4549. Many retired El Paso area homeowners don't know where to begin when it comes to downsizing and selling their home. Patrick Tuttle and his legacy home team follow a proven process to help retired homeowners sell faster and for more money. Call Patrick Tuttle at 915-588-18. Thank you all so very much for joining us here for the El Paso History Radio Show, airing in this pre-recorded episode on News Radio 690 KTSM. I'm your host, Andrew J. Polk. Of course, want to mention what we got coming up for you on the next edition of the show as we're getting into the new month and February. First show we're going to be having on for you there is going to be guests from the Waco Tanks State Park and Historic Site. Of course, we'll be mentioning some about the 100th anniversary of the Texas State Park System. And there's a lot of history even going beyond that out at Waco Tanks, including a lot of events that they have coming up for us. We'll be visiting with some of their staff. So, again, that'll be next week on the program talking about Waco Tanks, both the, well, currently ongoings there and the history presence on the ground there as well. But, again, uh, joining us here in studio right now, we are, of course, joined by uh, David Romo, El Paso historian. And there's a lot, we kind of mentioned it, kind of case in point at the end of last segment about how there are so many different little points of history and mm -hmm. things there once you start delving into it. And as much as we have the, you know, the big view of it, again, this looking kind of south on it from the uh, Sunset Heights area. And there was one kind of area and building in particular. Again, there's a, a few different phrases right. people may know, like, you know, the mansion that we'll get to here, uh, the Florida de Luna. And then this one is of particular interest. So wh where is this that we're looking right so now? So this would have been in the corner of Overland and and El Paso Street. And that's the reason Overland is named Overland Street is because the wagon trail, there was a, a, a trail that went from St. Louis all the way to San Francisco, the Overland uh, mm. uh, mail trail. 
And Anson Mills owned this building originally in, in the 1850s. It's an, a, an adobe structure, and that was one of the stagecoach stops okay. of the Overland Drive. So remember, the streets, he's the one that did the first plat. So that's why we say Duranguito was the, the oldest platted neighborhood that right. had streets. So the names of the streets were based on north-south and east-west railroad destinations. So the Chihuahua Santa Fe Street was because that mm -hmm. was the destination because the Camino Real went right through that. So that's a, like a historical memory that that was later it was called right. the Chihuahua Santa Fe Trail during the Mexican period. It was called Camino Real during the Spanish colonial period. And then you had Overland Street because that's exactly where the Overland Trail went through. You had San Francisco Street, San Antonio Street. Missouri, so, all these different names come to mind here. Even if the idea of it actually connecting directly to those right, destinations right. may but not have was, been totally exactly. accurate, but the concept. Right. But if, if you look at specifically Duranguito, it sure. was, those were the destinations, right? So um, what's really interesting about this is that in 1861, there's a whole history of the Civil War of the Southwest that most people don't know, and they don't know the huge mm -hmm. role that fronterizos, the, the, the Mexican-American community played in stopping the, the Confederate invasion of the Southwest. So when there was this, this, this huge battle up you know, near, uh, just north of Santa Fe, the Glorieta Pass, right. where the, the Hispanos, they knew the terrain like the back of the hand, and they helped the, the Union Army um, uh, locate the, the, this background pass locate and destroy the confederate supplies so the confederates thousands of them were forced to come back through el paso and here they were attacked by the fronterizos so there was like a, a like a uh, guerrilla warfare right mm -hmm. going on against the confederate soldiers here in the el paso area a lot of them of these confederates died from the disease and they used that same building that had been used as a stagecoach on the northwest corner of, of Duranguito um, to as a Confederate hospital. So W.W. Uh, w. Mills writes the 40, my 40 years uh, in El Paso, and he mentions that there was some place to the west of that, confe uh, of that Confederate hospital, there was a cemetery where about 40 Confederate dead hmm, were buried. Okay. And nobody has been able to locate it my estimate is that it's somewhere right there on the corner of Santa Fe and Overland Street, like a, a block down. And why? Because of that, that remained like an empty lot for a long time okay. in the mapping. So the availability structures. of it, essentially. So there's a possibility that we have a Confederate um, cemetery within Duranguito, within the, the so-called arena footprint area. That, that's what it was called, thankfully, in the past, not now. Oh, sure. Um, and so... Yeah, it's not anything that we want to commemorate or celebrate the, the Confederates, but it's part of the history. It's, it's the history and there, it, yeah. And it's, uh, and it's a, a, a little-known aspect of the Duranguito history that nobody, there's no marker there, no... Right. And, and, and you know, all we, we need is to do some kind of um, underground, uh, like, sonar, what do you call the it? Radar, the radar, yeah. The radar, and might, might be able to look that. Yeah, GPR. They have found some adobe structures on Chihuahua Street. And those adobe structures may go back all the way, just like walls from the underground oh, sure. radar, the sonar, the you know that kind of archaeological survey that you don't have to dig. And those walls may be from either the 1827 settlement, or they might even be to the Apache for the Apache settlements, because sometimes the Spaniards would build uh, walls mm. for the the, the so-called capitancillos, the the Nantan, the leaders of the different rancherias these cluster group family cluster groups so you know there's so much under the ground that we don't know exactly what we'll find but if, if if we don't even have the primary documentation like for instance if you don't know that there were tunnels connecting what i saw the what i oh, just sure. showed you as the michael dolan i've been to that tunnel there's an underground well there's a basement that appears to go as a tunnel then you don't know what to look for and that was that was one of the elements of the Texas Antiquities trial. But the city hired a group from Houston that wasn't very familiar with the city's native history or Mexican Revolution history, even its Asian history. And so there's another Asian building that 
that, that we can talk about in a little bit. Yeah, let's uh, get to that here because we got to take oh, that. the Chinese laundry. Exactly. Yeah, that's one of the ones that I mentioned that has been certainly mentioned a lot of. But got to take that next break right now. So still talking again in this next segment with uh, David Romo, El Paso historian, about again what's on the ground or under it in some cases in Durangito right. and the area. So back after this break with more here on the El Paso History Radio Show on News Radio 690 KTSM. You are listening to the El Paso History Radio Show streaming on Facebook where you can find archived radio programs. The El Paso History Radio Show also streams on the Facebook page Remember in El Paso When, run by Chief Administrator Barbara Given Bainey, known as BGB. Check out that page for thousands of archived pictures and videos of El Paso history. Remember in El Paso When on Facebook. Visit Mission Del Rey Southwest for a huge selection of El Paso souvenirs, decor, and gifts. Mission Del Rey features El Paso saddle blanket products and thousands of Southwest, Native American, and Mexico items, plus unique pottery, blankets, and turquoise jewelry. Bring your family and out-of-town guests to visit Mission Del Rey Southwest's large showroom at Lee Trevino and Pelicano and see their website at missiondelrey.com, 915-440-2140 for souvenirs, gifts, and decor. Mission Del Rey Southwest. Pepe's New Mexican Restaurant and Cantina serves the old Griggs Mexican food recipes in a new location at 6761 Donovan Drive. Enjoy great New Mexican food with cold beer and the Juan and only margarita from the cantina. The managers and cooks from the original Griggs Restaurant serve tacos, combination plates, and sopapillas. Get the best Mexican food in the valley at Pepe's New Mexican Restaurant and Cantina, 6761 Donovan near Loop 375. Call 877-2152. M1 EP Management Corporation is proud to sponsor the El Paso History Show. If you're tired of the ups and downs of the stock market, invest in real estate. M1 EP manages apartments in El Paso and helps investors buy, hold, and sell property. See the website, m1ep.com, m numeral one epcom To learn more about the many benefits and long-term appreciation, call 915-592-4549. 915-592-4549. Many retired El Paso area homeowners don't know where to begin when it comes to downsizing and selling their home. Patrick Tuttle and his legacy home team follow a proven process to help retired homeowners sell faster and for more money. Call Patrick Tuttle at 915-588-1850 today. Thank you all so very much for joining us here for the El Paso History Radio Show, airing in this pre-recorded episode on News Radio 690. KTSM. I am your host, Andrew J. Polk. Of course, I have to remind you about some of our other great partners in helping promote this show, and even with tweets this week, uh, El Paso Wink. Go there each week for a, our promo announcements, and of course, their in-depth and original reporting here, El Paso's Business Journal. El Paso Inc. is available for home or business delivery to receive El Paso Wink, or get your digital subscription ordered online at elpasoinc.com. And of course, one of our more sponsors, we have to remind you about Mission Del Rey Southwest. Go there with out-of-town visitors for their souvenirs, jewelry, gifts, and decor items galore. They have a ton of different, always the selection is always changing, always refreshing and getting new things in here. Where they're talking about the literal or figurative flavors of the Southwest, both with, again, those decor items. They have uh, great wo woven rugs, uh, Native American products uh, sourced directly from creators, as well as food things. Again, literal flavors there as well. Uh, so check them out. And, again, great place to take people that you want to, you know, out-of-town visitors or even just for your own decor. You can, of course, visit MissionDelRay.com. They do ship around the world. Or visit their 12,000-square-foot showroom on Lee Trevino. Mention the El Paso History Radio Show for a discount or give them a call at 9 Nine one five four four zero two one four zero. That's nine one five four four zero two one four zero. But again, joining us in studio here as we have on this program, uh, talking with uh, David Romo, El Paso historian. And so I want to mention at least a little bit about what well, you just mentioned. Actually, one of those buildings, probably one of the more, at the very least, one I've heard mentioned most often, if not uh, more of the more famous ones. Here, I think uh, arguably at least. Depiction-wise, probably the Florida de Luna building has been one of the more recognizable yes, ones right. of the mm -hmm. whole area. But uh, some of the other ones, including the Chinese Laundry, and we have a, a graphical right. representation of this is more on the redevelopment part of it here. But so what is this location? Right. So that's the, from the Rebirth of Duranguito alternative plan that the community generated. So this location is in 1901, it, was, it served as the Chinese Laundry. So there were about three or four Chinese uh, laundries or establishments, restaurants during the turn of the century. Because El Paso had the largest Chinatown mm -hmm. in Texas. Most people don't know that. And that's because so many Chinese came as part of the, um, Railroad, the, Southern, the yeah. Southern Pacific, Pacific Railroad. And several hundred stayed here. And Chinatown wasn't like a specific location. 
So it did spread into Duranguito. It went down into the Segundo Barrio, down to the mm. Oregon Street. And it is one of the last known structures that still exists, is still standing, of that Chinatown era mm. in El Paso. So we, in our alternative view, uh, plan for the regeneración, we're calling it the restoration of Duranguito, it, it can be a, like an Asian American cultural center, right, to honor the presence and the contributions of uh, of the Chinese uh, migrants to El Paso. Because remember, after 1881, you had the Chinese Exclusion Act in 1882. Right. And so a lot of them were determined, quote-unquote, illegal aliens, as the language of, of the time, a dehumanizing term. But it, it uh, and so that was also part of our history, right? That, that the yeah. first, I mean, migration is a huge part of our history. So that well, I mean, that defines the region more exactly, or less in a lot right? of ways here. So that's one of the structures here, one of the famous ones. But of course, I think probably next to the the Flor de Luna building, the very least way it gets refers to the mansion is probably one of the more right. the next most recognizable ones here. And this one, you can see it as the. Uh, the way it was at the time here. And this building has a lot of interesting different history associated oh, yeah, with it. Oh, yeah, yeah. So a lot of people know it as the brothel, but it didn't start off as the brothel. It was uh, constructed in 1902, and it served primarily as a luxury hotel and a boarding house for Euro-American males connected to the railroad industry. So beginning in 1908, it did serve as a brothel in which the female sex workers were paid, pay, they had to pay monthly taxes, quote-unquote, to the to the city hall to provide the services to their customers with relatively little interference from the police mm-hmm. and failure to pay their taxes would result in vice rates. What's really interesting in the 1940s, it was one of a, a couple, two or three legal uh, brothels where all they had to do yeah. was just uh, submit themselves to uh, the sex workers had to go to health inspections, and it was legalized so that was an experiment that was going on but during once world war ii began the the army fort bliss said no no we can't do that we can't be no, having that around can't. here as much as there's trouble with specific bars nowadays exactly. and places people are brand are banished from when military yeah. service i can only imagine that being a particular focus yeah so the thing is that uh, there was controversy so why do we want to s- save a brothel well you know the history of sex work is important right like in the intimate connection between brothels and City Hall has always been part of El, El Paso, or for a lot of its history, I would say. Right? There's, I mean, there's a whole even <laughs> lens about looking at, uh, you know, in the, uh, com- frankly, you could draw a line between the quote-unquote Wild West era that then we were right. looking at at that point in time, the transition from, and including the fact that of, well, arguably the civilizing influence that these kind of institutions would have, because there's a certain amount of, well, infrastructure, you know, ability, it's stuff to be had yeah. to, to, that requires it. So there's other interesting ways and, and lenses to look at this here. You also have some examples uh, in your research of, um, well, of the other time frames in right. that building here, including right. when it was being uh, put forth as, well, lodging. Yeah, and, and we, we talked about uh, about the mansion with residents who lived there in the 19. 19- 50s and mm. that became a, a family apartment house uh, yeah interesting it was called that. la mansión de los gatos the mansion of the cats because you know there were so many families with cats a lot of cats would hang out in the mansión de los gatos and and the kids that lived in the mansion no well kids that lived even in, uh, in the area before while it was a brothel remember that that the the sex workers were were very kind to them because this was supposed to be like a quote-unquote upper class brothel and when okay. like uh, they were waiting to get into the school and it was cold a lot of them would like t- tell them come on in and they would give them chocolate you know hot chocolate mm-hmm. and what have you and there was you know n- nothing indecent they, the, the, the oral history to say no they were just really nice to us you know the, the, the uh, so there's all kinds of stories and human stories you know people oh, yeah. like to judge and say why do you want to save a brothel but no you're not only saving a brothel you're you're saving a lot of histories every Every building, like I said, has a many stories to tell Absolutely. about who we are as a what I call a globalized fronterizo border community. Absolutely. And so examples of other stories going on there. So this one, uh, of course, this one isn't present anymore, but the Franklin School here was, of course, a, a major <coughs> feature of the area. Exactly. So the Franklin School was constructed in, in 1891 and it's on 215th Leon Street and it cost $15,000 to construct by Ernst Krauss, and he was uh, 
uh, one of the most prominent architects of, of that period. Uh, during the Mexican Revolution, so originally it was a school for mostly like the, not the wealthy, the wealthy and middle class. And during the Mexican Revolution, the 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 demographics of the neighborhood shifted to mostly oh, sure. Mexican, and it was one of the four Mexican schools. And so it was torn down in the 1850s, and now there's a parking garage there, and it was such a beautiful structure. But we, in our alternative plan that that was community generated, we want to turn we we want to bring back like low income housing we want to restore what was broken in the community and we want to like bring back some of those details of these of these demolished homes so this is know, the and, rendering and you have here where you can see some of the downtown buildings including exactly. like the uh, Paso the Norte hotel in the background there right. and so what you're kind of calling forth in the rendering there is that it uh, is to take back the details the architectural details that, you see that onion dome yeah the onion dome the very mm -hmm. recognizable you know kind of bulbous shape with the point on top of it there yeah. so so that's uh, that, some of the concept there you're going for and so when people talk about an old town we don't want those fake hollywood you know like uh, yeah sure uh, we want what really was there, right? The authentic, o original, historic sites, and 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 like I said, micro history, it it, it, it throws curveballs at you. You you're not expecting <laughs> that kind of yeah. it almost almost like a Russian Orthodox stuff. That's not what you relate to the old West. No, but in no. 1890, that kind of architecture. In 1885, yeah. when like I said, the uh, the mescaleros were fighting the not only the mescaleros, Geronimo was fighting the U.S. Army. You had these Bay Area, the, the Bay windows that look very much like San Francisco. You had that kind of architecture, right? Mm -hmm. So that's what we're pushing for, like authentic, an authentic, quote unquote, old town. I, I, I don't necessarily like that name, but a historical heritage site that honors the living history, the people that are living there. Because you can do things that don't have to displace the people that are there. Like, for instance, well, in, in our alternative view, we have a yerberia, which is a, a, like a traditional herbal medicine okay. shop. And that's like Las Señoras del Barrio, the women of, of the Segundo Barrio and the surrounding barrios. That's still part of their tradition. Yet, I'm sure there'll be like tourists from San Francisco that will come to El Paso to learn about like the native I indigenous fronterizo healing traditions. Because it's real and it's genuine. Mm -hmm. They don't want to come down to, like, you know, buy $50 Guatemalan margaritas and franchise stores. You know, you have that kind of stuff everywhere. We'll tell so, you what. Let's talk more about that, right. that plant and those parts of it. Got to take that uh, last break before we're at the end of this hour right now. So stay tuned. More on that. But essentially, those plans and the consideration of what comes next here on the El Paso History Radio Show on News Radio 690 KTSM. You are listening to the El Paso History Radio Show streaming on Facebook where you can find archived radio programs. The El Paso History Radio Show also streams on the Facebook page Remember in El Paso When, run by Chief Administrator Barbara Gibbon Bainey, known as BGB. Check out that page for thousands of archived pictures and videos of El Paso history. Remember in El Paso When on Facebook. Visit Mission Del Rey Southwest for a huge selection of El Paso souvenirs, decor, and gifts. Mission Del Rey features El Paso saddle blanket products and thousands of Southwest, Native American, and Mexico items, plus unique pottery, blankets, and turquoise jewelry. Bring your family and out-of-town guests to visit Mission Del Rey Southwest's large showroom at Lee Trevino and Pelicano and see their website at missiondelrey.com, 915-440-2140 for souvenirs, gifts, and decor. Mission Del Rey Southwest. Pepe's New Mexican Restaurant and Cantina serves the old Griggs Mexican food recipes in a new location at 6761 Donovan Drive. Enjoy great New Mexican food with cold beer and the Juan and only margarita from the cantina. The managers and cooks from the original Griggs Restaurant serve tacos, combination plates, and sopapillas. Get the best Mexican food in the valley at Pepe's New Mexican Restaurant and Cantina, 6761 Donovan near Loop 375. Call 877-2152. M1 EP Management Corporation is proud to sponsor the El Paso History Show. If you're tired of the ups and downs of the stock market, invest in real estate. M1 EP manages apartments in El Paso and helps investors buy, hold, and sell property. See the website, m1ep.com, m numeral one ep.com. To learn more about the many benefits and long-term appreciation, call 915-592-4549. 915-592-4549. Many retired El Paso area homeowners don't know where to begin when it comes to downsizing and selling their home. 
Patrick Tuttle and his legacy home team follow a proven process to help retired homeowners sell faster and for more money. Call Patrick Tuttle at 915-588-1850 today and get your home sold faster and for more money. That's Patrick Tuttle at 915-588-1850. Call him today. The El Paso History Radio Show also streams on Saturday mornings on our YouTube channel, El Paso History TV. Go to youtube.com slash El Paso History TV for archives of the El Paso History Radio Show. Also on that YouTube channel, you can see for free many other videos, documentaries, and lectures about El Paso area history at youtube.com slash El Paso History TV. Additionally, watch a dozen TV documentaries about El Paso history for free there on our YouTube channel. This includes Legends of El Paso's Mountains, Gunfights of the Old West, El Paso's Waco Tanks, Mexican Revolution Sites in El Paso, and eight more TV documentaries produced by El Paso filmmaker Jackson Polk since 2001. And at youtube.com slash El Paso History TV, you can watch for free 20 short videos we produced that were broadcast on ABC7 KVIA TV newscasts. This series is called El Paso History TV and features Spanish missions and churches on El Paso's Mission Trail, plus the Guadalupe Mission in Juarez, Mexico. That church was built in 1659 and is the oldest known adobe building on the El Paso Juarez Valley. It still welcomes Catholic. Thank you all so very much for having joined us here for the El Paso History Radio Show, airing on News Radio 690 KTSM in this pre recorded episode. I've been your host, Andrew J. Polk. A couple other things we want to talk about before we get to the end of the program here, as we still, of course, have uh, David Romo, El Paso historian, in with us now. We mentioned a couple of things going on with essentially what, what happens now, because, of course, the yeah. history, uh, the importance of it, how that can be you know integrated and continuing on here. Um, Community involvement is obviously kind of critical with that because the kind of way I think about it is that, sure, if you only have new things, everything demolished, no sense of history, it feels sanitized. But then if you have buildings that never change and uh, people don't inhabit, those are more often called ruins. So right. you don't really kind of want to go either end of that spectrum is, yeah. is kind of what the idea is now. And so uh, you mentioned that there's actually an event coming up to kind yeah. of – We'll kind of focus on, celebrate, and kind of push together what comes next, right? Right. So we're calling it uh, Duranguito Pachanga. Pachanga means like a big festival, a celebration, a block party. And that's going to happen on February 4th, uh, Saturday from 1 to 5. It's free, open to the public. There's going to be bands. There's going to be art booths and uh, all kinds of stuff. It's going to be fun. We are celebrating something that, I really, it's, it's unprecedented. Like, how many places have you seen have fought, especially Mexican American communities, have fought against big development projects? And I'm thinking of like Chavez Ravine, where the Dodgers Stadium uh, ended up displacing hundreds of mm -hmm. Mexican American families. There are very few examples like what has happened here in El Paso that a community all together has stood in defense for years. And with the help of a lot of allies, but, you know, people literally stood in front of bulldozers. They joined litigations. You know, I was very fortunate and honored to have been part of, of the trial that the city just dropped. Uh, uh, we won right. a mm. court case based on the history of the Apaches. So I say it's the, the ghost of the Mescalero Apaches uh, came to the rescue. <laughs> okay. Right? Uh, Interesting way because to it was their history that, that, that saved uh, our barrio. Um, and so we're celebrating, and it's uh, there's a lot of attention. So what's next? What are we going to do next? And as you say, it has to all of the community has to buy in. So we right, created yeah. this plan way back. You know, there was a point there in 2016 where the city had said we're going to take Duranguito off the chopping block, and we got to work right away. Okay, what do we want to do now? So we worked together from the bottom up, not the top down. We didn't we didn't go to like San Francisco experts. Like, unfortunately, the city has done in the past. We went to the real experts, our community ourselves, right? Mm -hmm. The San Francisco experts didn't even consult or the historians to, to see building, like building, like what you're doing with me right now, or the, the, the residents who are the experts as well. Because you right. see, in the, in, in the 1990s, 1997, the community, uh, El Paso got $53 million, and it was a, a livable community grants and that was they they used the impetus of organizing by there's Toñita Morales was one of the 95 year old resident that organized a cleanup campaign to clean up her own barrio and they used that to the city did 
to write funds and granting federal grants that that they later used to build that um, that park, the firefighters oh, park, right. mm-hmm. and later bring in lamps and all kinds of amenities to to the area. And then all of a sudden they said, "Oh no, no, we're going to destroy it. We're going to tear it down for for an arena." So, so we're continuing. We're we're bringing back that energy from people. And so we got some renderings that we've, I mean, we've had yeah. a couple of them so far. Yeah, I mean, so you see the Flor things. de Luna. Mm. We are, are architects. We hired three young ar- architects, Paso del Sur, which is the group of, of people that have been working together with the residents. Um, and they said, you know, don't hide the fact that there's holes there because there's this art of Kintsugi. It's a Japanese art oh, where yeah. you mm. restore broken shards of teacups and you use gold e- epoxy. And the fact that something was broken and now has been healed and fixed and repaired gives it an extra sense of beauty. Now it has character. It has patina. It has, And that's what we're going to do with this neighborhood. We're going to restore it. We're going to mm-hmm. heal it. Not only the buildings, but the community. Because these buildings were deliberately um, torn down partially, but also the community was deliberately displaced and their networks were... And so we want to open up a lot that's our plan to bring back create new low-income housing and infill housing but some of these original buildings <coughs> allow the people that were displaced to come back and we've several have said we would like to come back we were displaced and so all these buildings and and all the effort we just had a um a, a volunteer more than 60 uh, people from all over right. the city mm-hmm. came and we started doing uh these restorations you know we the yarns uh, wrapping uh, painting some of the buildings right. So that, right there's that kiko mendez that elderly man he's 83 years old and he used to live in duranguito and here there he is helping to paint some of the mm. buildings you know cr- create just color and beauty and we know that it's just the start you, you you can't rebuild rome in a day there's a lot more to plan but yeah, welcome to Duranguito, the birthplace of El Paso. We want to be an inclusive space, not a space that says, you know, this is only for tourists. No, we want the people that live there to share in that progress. So a lot more to possibly come there. But again, I appreciate the time we spent talking about what is there currently and, and what can be used, built on, et cetera, all those kind of things here. So again, uh, joining us right now here on the program has been uh, David Romo, El Paso historian. So thank you very much for talking to us about oh, some of the you. history, the aspect. I mean, we honestly only even scratched the surface on a lot oh, of these yeah. things. But There's so much more. Delving into it, I found very useful. So I appreciate that. Thank you very much again oh, to thank you today. You. Thank and, you for the invitation. Yeah. Absolutely. And thank you all for joining us here for the El Paso History Radio Show. I've been your host, Andrew J. Polk. We'll be back next week on the program with more on, well, all the things that we talk about next week specifically Waco Tanks. See y'all then. See you, Pepe's after the show.